Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the latest edition of the Woke Bros. Of course, I'm Big Waz, a.k.a. Wosni Lambre. I'm here, joined as always by my brother, my partner for real, like the Waynes, Fernando Villa. <laughs> What's going on, Nando? <laughs> I'm doing well. Doing well. I, no, no one's called me Fernando in a long, long time. So in a yeah. long for all time. The breaking news: My real name is not Nando. Nando is a nickname. It's kind of like how Big yes, Waz is not his real name. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, on, uh, of course, we got Rob Lopez on the ones and threes, keeping the show running on time on today's show. Oh, Lord, this this Reddit thing that happened yesterday with GameStop and Wall Street and <laughs> trolling and the scam of the stock market and all of those things. I think it's like it's so perfectly encapsulate our moment. Right. Like about yeah. people being home, the scam of Wall Street as some indicator of the health of the wallets of normal people and just how completely and utterly rigged. Wall Street is. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's 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 perfect. It's just perfect, that story. So we'll get into as best we can, because neither one of us are, you know, financial analysts or Wall Street experts, but as best we can sort of get into the nitty gritty of that story. But first, as always, Nando, we got to start with the stimulus or lack thereof mm. um, going on. The, the $2 trillion package that Joe Biden is trying to get through has stalled in the con it well obviously in the senate we know the house can get anything it wants through the senate is where the problems lie and so it's stalled in the senate uh the usual suspects have already started their sabotage mode um of course joe manchin which i don't know why he gets to call himself a democrat it's kind of weird but whatever Joe Manchin is is one of the people holding this up, along with many other things, the filibuster, all things that we talked about um, previously, Nando. But as best as you can, uh, what's your read on what's happening right now at this moment? Yeah. So what's happening right now is that Joe Biden had a couple of choices to make on how he started off his legislative agenda. And the two options, broadly speaking, were to like put everything into one bill, everything he wanted to do into one bill, and then try to get that through. Or he had the the choice of like splitting everything up into separate bills. For example, the two thousand dollar checks, or which then became the fourteen hundred dollar checks. Just do a clean bill on the fourteen hundred dollar checks, and then worry about the other stuff later. Um, you know, I kind of, I mean, obviously you never know with these things, but I was under the, my opinion at the time was like, it's probably best to do a narrow, small bill because there was so much pressure around this after the Georgia elections and things like that. And some Republicans were running scared and some had already been on the record saying they supported it. So if they would have just like passed a clean bill for $1,400 checks, plus maybe some, you know, vaccine distribution funding, that may have been, maybe you could have gotten that through. Um, and, but instead he put everything in there, he put the $1,400 checks, he put aid to state and local businesses in there. He put the $15 minimum wage in there. He put the, um, uh, the explain expansion of unemployment insurance in there. He put the, obviously the vaccine distribution in there, all the stuff he put in there. And it was, it became much easier for a lot of Republicans to say no to it, you know, like, yeah, maybe we support part of this, but we can't, we can't support like this giant bill. And part of what stalled it was that the way the Senate runs, it's on something called unanimous consent. It's very fucking boring and unimportant. But the point is that Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer basically had to come to some agreement to basically open up the new Senate, this what's called a power sharing agreement. Anyway, the, um, the point is that in that negotiation, it came down to the filibuster, what to do about the filibuster. McConnell obviously wants to keep the filibuster because it's what maintains obviously. his power. And power. Schumer yep. like is under like is trying to basic, basically at least leave the door open for the filibuster to be repealed. Because let's be clear, nothing will happen without that. Nothing will get 60 votes in the Senate, which is what you need to overcome a filibuster right now. Nothing. The only hope for anything the Democrats want to do is to abolish the filibuster. But of course, there's plenty of Democratic senators who don't want to abolish the filibuster. Chief among them, two senators, 
Joe Manchin from West Virginia, and Kristen Cinema from Arizona. They indicated that they will not abolish the filibuster no ma- under any circumstances, which is what allowed McConnell to then claim victory and be like, okay, look, they, they committed that they're not going to abolish the filibuster. Let's do this power sharing agreement. So th- to make a very long story short, the, the point is that the Senate is where is where things go to die in American politics. Now and 100 years ago and 150 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> it's the amount of times that the House and the President are aligned on something and then it dies in the Senate is like more than I can count. I mean, that's why civil rights took 100 years to pass after the end of the Civil War. The Civil War ended in 1865. Civil rights did not pass till 1964, 99 years later. It was because of the Senate and specifically because of the filibuster. So that's where we're at. We're at kind of a standoff in which Dems are um, staring down the barrel of a gun because they know they have two years to do something um, big or they're going to lose big in 2022. Like they they already have to be thinking about that. Like if they don't pass anything meaningful, they're going to get whacked in 2022. Mm-hmm. So um, that's where we're off. We're in, we're in a bit of a stalemate and it's incredibly frustrating. The damage to the Democrats, cre- the Democrats credibility is enormous. I mean, they ran on certain promises and they're not going to deliver them because of this kind of intransigence of some of their members in the Senate. Um, and yeah, Before it just looks on, very bleak. Because people are going to be wondering, why would these two Democrats, and mind you, like, let's be clear here, right? Um, we remember during a certain campaign, a certain two campaigns about who's a real Democrat and who's not. And all of this and what makes you a Democrat for real and all of this other crap. Um, Meanwhile, there are people like Joe Manchin who are constantly caucusing with the Republicans, like Hmm. at almost every single turn, specifically when it comes to this economic stuff. Like this is when he loves it the most. Right. Yeah. Um, What like what is the sort of public face that Joe Manchin is putting on why he's deciding to be on the side of letting Republicans share power with the party that he's a fucking member of? Well, I mean, I mean, the, the, the short answer is that. You know, Joe Manchin was elected into West Virginia uh, in the first place in in a different era, you know, essentially when, (laughs) first of all, West Virginia was a traditional Democratic stronghold um, forever. And then it kind of turned into, it's like, just like the rest of the country, any rural area has become more and more heavily Republican in the last several decades. And um, so Joe Manchin is kind of like a holdover from an era in which, you know, the poor states voted Democrat, you know, including in the South. Um, And... You know, he maintains his position because he basically can pose in opposition to the Democratic Party on certain issues, um, certain times. Um, That's the only way he maintains his power in a state which voted for Donald Trump by like 20 points, you know. Um, The thing is, the thing is that he he he's probably I mean, you know, he's been there for a long time. So, you know, obviously he knows his state. But I get the sense that he would actually be better off if he used the abolishment of the filibuster and his swing vote as a way to extract certain concessions from Democrats, Be, namely pork being like, I want like, uh, like, I don't know, money for West Virginia. And if he does that, he'll be elected forever. I mean, it's just that right. he, it's just not in his in his mind space in any way, you know, like, but he could be theoretically do that and just be like, OK, I'll 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 support, you know, whatever you want, as long as I get, you know, a military base in West Virginia, a bri- you know, like a giant bridge here, right. you know, some highways, ra- train stations, right. you know, money for all this shit in West Virginia that will improve West Virginians' lives, and then I just run on that and I'll win forever. So that that's that's what that is. Is just that he he thinks he has to like pose as a Republican to win in a Republican leaning state, and he's probably right about that. But he's probably he's yeah. just wrong in the way like no one in West Virginia cares about the filibuster. They just don't like they they really don't. Right. <laughs> they they care about owning the libs. So what he could do is like own the libs all the time uh, rhetorically, and you know signal that he's not a not a Democrat like on culture war issues. Um, but he could uh, he could use his power to like actually extract um, uh, concessions from uh, from Democrats for his state. So and more and and you know because people are like intuitively going to ask another question: What can anybody do about this dude or these two Dems 
who are holding things up. Like, what can Joe Biden do? What can Chuck Schumer do theoretically to to Manchin and um the lady from from Arizona? Like, how, like what what is there to do about this? Well, you know, insubordination, basically. <laughs> nothing really. I mean, they, they don't really have much leverage over them. I mean. That's the that's one of the problems is that the party um, doesn't have uh, you know doesn't have any real leverage over them. <laughs> that's just the long and the short of it. I mean, I mean, I guess Chuck Schumer. I mean, Chuck Schumer is also just not the kind of guy to to He's punish someone for like that. He's, He's not going to play hardball. Like, hardball. I mean, he could like in theory deny them like committee you know uh, places or whatever like the, all these things that senators care about, but it just seems unlikely that Schumer would would blow up his own caucus. Um, by, by doing that. So, yeah, they really don't have that much leverage at the end of the day. And another thing that I wonder, you know, specifically as somebody who didn't care for Joe Biden before he ran for president um, during his the Democratic Party, uh, uh, what you would call it, primary um, during his presidential bid, uh, Joe Biden's ability to magically <laughs> turn Republicans from actual Republicans to people that want to govern. Whatever happened to Joe Biden's bipartisan magic wand that he was going to wave over the Senate and all his buddies who he's had whiskeys with for 30 fucking years and Joe was going to lean on how good he is at reaching across the aisle and making Republicans love him and policies that help people just because he's Joe Biden. He was going to reverse the tide of obstructionist Republican Party tactics going back essentially to Newt freaking Gingrich. 1994, yeah. okay? That was 26 years ago. It's been 26 years of this. 26 years. You were the vice president when Mitch McConnell said, our number one goal is to make fucking Barack Obama a one-term president. We're not here to govern. We're here to have maintain our fucking power dominance. What happened to Joe Biden's ability to be the soothsayer of obstructionist yeah. Republicans? What happened to that? So... I mean, it's so unbelievably frustrating because it's like, we know who Mitch McConnell is. We know what the Republicans are going to do, my man. Like, <laughs> God, it's just like, we know we we could have predicted all of this, which is why- But he ran people, on this shit. He did. I know. And people, but the thing is, voters like love that shit. They love like, oh yeah, he's going to be bipartisan. We're going to like un unite and whatever. And it's like, no, you can't do that anymore. The, the cat's out of the bag. That's why like people on the left were like, the only way that Joe Biden's going to be successful as president is if he- governs aggressively by using executive action, you know, very aggressively. That's like it. Not, There's nothing else not, he can do. Like, yeah. And and then and then using that threat constantly is like, we're just gonna go around you guys if you don't if you don't play ball. Like you gotta play a hard ball. You gotta say like, okay, I'm gonna cancel student debt. What are you gonna do about it? You know, like which he can do. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna Nash. I'm gonna give a pathway to citizenship to 11 million undocumented immigrants. You know, like just do things that they like that they that will horrify them, so that <laughs> force them to come to the negotiating table. You know, like you, you got to play hardball. You can't negotiate with these terrorists. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and uh, I so don't wanna, I, I just don't like. It's just again, the naivete was, is what's crazy. He, you know, but he was Barry's freaking vice president. When people were voting again, when Republicans were voting against, against their own policies that Barry would bring to the table, they were voting against shit that they laws that they literally wrote and presented. When once Barry presented them, they said, fuck that. We don't want to be seen as ever having helped this dude do anything. You were there. This is like. This didn't happen like 10 years before you when you weren't at the seat of power. Like you were there. So this delusion about what Republicans are going to do because Joe Biden asked them to in his folksy kind of come on, man, type of way that he's just going to wave a magic wand. This shit. I'm sorry. I don't want to get off to the start of shitting on Joe Biden. But like we told you so. Like, everybody yeah. knew this was going to happen. And then again, it's not just a matter of having 50 freaking Democrats in there when you have Weasley-ass Democrats. And again, Nando beautifully illustrated why Joe Manchin has to act the way he acts. Like, well, that's the thing the is, Joe Manchin, I, I understand Joe Manchin more than 
than other Democrats who caucus with Republicans all the time who are not as famous, like, you know, peop- like, for example, Tim Kaine and, and Mark Warner from Virginia. Right. Virginia is like a, a very blue state. They don't have to, they don't, there's no reason why they have to side with Republicans on important issues. Like, you know, for example, Tim Kaine voted for bank deregulation under Trump in 2018. Of course. Okay. Why did he do that? I mean, there's no reason, no reason why he needed to, uh, <laughs> you know, like those, the conservative, Dem- there's tons of conservative Democrats like the ones in Virginia, who um, who don't need to be. I mean, Joe Manchin like has to, on some way, at least position himself as an independent. I get that. You know, I really do. Yeah. I, I I actually I actually sympathize with that no, position. No, politically, like if you're a Democrat in a, like and it, and he's not like Sherrod Brown, which is like this shit just went started going the other way on him, right? Like, and he's like, you know, he's able to maintain power of his own personal popularity. Like, this shit has been going this way for years. And it's even a miracle that a guy with a D next to his name could win in West Virginia. So, yeah, I I, I get that to 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 the extent that it does. Right. Like, like this. He is self-interested in behaving like a Republican in a state where Republicans fucking dominate. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um. Again, we told you so. We could have predicted this. It's not shocking, but it's what's shocking is the sort of liberal naivete of how things really work in this day and age. The era of bipartisan comedy and agreement is over. It was never really like that. Like it's always like the nostalgia is always there. They for love it. talking about Tip O'Neill. They yeah, <laughs> they and love it. yeah, exactly. And um, <laughs> but like the the sort of not normal state of American politics is hyper division and uh, gridlock, which is what happened in the 19th century the whole time. It's what largely what the Civil War was fought over is because they couldn't resolve the issue of slavery uh, politically and democratically. They had to do it um, by fighting, <laughs> fighting it out. Um, that's that's just the uh, that's just the normal state of American t- politics because of the way the system is designed. Um, and, you know, the thing is, Democrats are in, a, in are in real trouble. Like they're they're in real in a real danger spot because they 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 got the guy in the White House, they got the very slim majority in the Senate, and they have the House by another slim majority. There is a structural advantage for Republicans, and it's only going to get worse in the next decade because Republicans control more states, because they can re- control redistricting. Um, if Democrats don't do something to reverse those structural advantages, meaning the Electoral College and the Senate, they're going to be in trouble like for the next decade or two. It's it's just it's just we're going to find ourselves in a situation where Republicans governed by minority. We're like the a minority of American people um, uh, vote for Republicans and they they control every lever of power. And at a certain point, Democratic voters are going to tire of keep on of like, you know, getting excited, working hard, you know, getting Warnock and Ossoff in there, busting their asses, donations, you know, canvassing the thing, posting all the shit and only to see that be all for naught, you know, like it's at a certain point, like people are just get tired of that shit. So if, if Democrats don't do something to change the calculus, meaning a abolish the electoral college, give statehood to DC and maybe Puerto Rico, um, or any other territory that wants it, um, expand voting rights <laughs> dramatically to all felons in every state, um, expand <laughs> unions, which help them mobilize voters for Democrats expand like if, unless they do something in the next two years like we could see find ourselves in a situation where republicans just dominate american politics despite being in a minority yeah it's it's depressing um again remember we mentioned uh the reconciliation option of just jamming it through that way but again when you when you are operating at the slimmest of margins and you can't count on every single dem to vote in your favor for something like that, it becomes the same exact issue as the as getting rid of the filibuster. Yeah. And you know, I'm I'm curious, why didn't Mitch McConnell get rid of the filibuster? When 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 when, when he was uh... when 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 they were in power? Oh, because when, the Democrats didn't use it. Ma- the Democrats didn't use it to block. <laughs> I mean, it's because hilarious. because he wanted two things. He wanted the tax cut and judges, and he got all those things. So, I mean, he doesn't care right. about anything so else. What's the p- so 
What's the, what's the point? Like, yeah, I'm sure to do this shit. Democrats like blocked minor legislation. Like they, yeah, they, they weren't able to repeal Obamacare. Although remember it took that, that vote by John McCain at the last second to, to not repeal Obamacare. Right. The dramatic thumbs yeah, down. The thumbs down. Yeah. But like, I mean, yeah, uh, repealing Obamacare was like a nice to have for McConnell. What he really wanted was the major tax cut for his donors and for the ruling class and, and the judges, judges to ensure conservative domination of the Supreme Court, but also all the federal courts uh, for the next 30 years. <laughs> so, yeah, that's why. <laughs> yeah. And so that's the state of things. Um, we don't know what's next, I guess, Joe. But look, again, they're going to not get these 2000 and I'm done doing the 14, whatever. Then They're going to not get $2,000 into people's pockets. That's what it's looking like. Or they're probably going to come to some others. They're going to be like, here's another 300 or something ridiculously insulting and disgusting. They're just going to compromise on that. Um, and and I'm sorry. I hate to be cynical, but it's hard for me to believe that they don't actually want this shit. Like, they don't actually want to be seen as trying to have done something and never getting anything done. Like, ever. Ever, 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 and just going to come back and say, well, the Republicans wouldn't let me. They just didn't let me do it. They didn't let me help you and feed your family. The Republicans are bad, bad, bad. And so... They can do so much through executive action. It's just crazy. Look, the day one agenda on the American Prospect website, just look up the day one agenda on the American Prospect website. It shows every single piece of legislation that they can do through executive action. They don't need Republicans for a lot of really important and good stuff that would help their chances of winning in 2020. And we're going to watch them not do it again. Um, yes, yeah, sorry to, to be all depressing and, 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 and messed up. But um, that's just what it is, guys. Uh, and we move on. <laughs> yeah, we move on to Reddit's Wall Street little threat. Or what do we call it? What do we call subreddit? What is it? I don't know. I'm not on Reddit. I'm. It's a subreddit. I'm yeah, old. I'm sorry. Is Reddit's yeah. Wall yeah. Street subreddit for everyday Joes like you and I to share information and sort of share memes about you know day trading and doing it on the side on apps like Robinhood. Uh, we're taping this on a Wednesday afternoon. Yesterday, Tuesday, was the culmination of a huge run on GameStop's stock. GameStop being, you know, a brick and mortar store where you go and buy video games. People my age, I'm 33, about to be 34. GameStop was one of those places like Toys R Us and KB Toy Store and yeah. all these places that we love to go. You just felt happy feelings being in yeah. those stores when you were a child. It was, I don't know, like there, there's certain retail experience. Toys R Us being Foot Locker. Foot Locker. I loved going to Foot Locker. I loved going to like, obviously Toys R Us, obviously GameStop. Even places like Best Buy was like Dude, fun. Dude, you know, and to to. watching Toys R Us commercials and... Like, it was just a feeling. Remember, like, Nick when Nickelodeon would do those shopping sprees where oh they would give you, like, a goodness. minute to run through and just put as much things as you like can into the fucking shopping of cart? Like how many Nerf products and Batman toys yeah. and Spider-Man joints. I remember yeah. I had a Magneto action figure where, like, he had a yeah. he had a thing in his fist that could just shoot out at people. It was, Yo. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just, like, GameStop is part of just a bygone era where retail could just, just going, literally, and maybe picking up one toy and looking at all the shit, all the video games, all the gadgets that you could get was just like an endorphin hit, right? Like GameStop is of that yeah. era. But again, in the time of e-commerce and, you know, buying everything online and having it delivered directly to your door while scratching your ass on your couch, you know, GameStop is becoming a bit obsolete, Right. Um, now, how, where does Wall Street and <laughs> and Reddit's uh, subreddit of of you know amateur day traders come in? <laughs> uh, you know, I guess a bunch of people on Reddit identify GameStop's app, GameStop's stock as being undervalued, and they decided, yo, this is a way for us to fuck. Wall Street right now, the people who are shorting the GameStop app um, and, you know, pump up this stock. 
You know, like the people yeah. who are shorting GameStop as a bet are betting that GameStop, because it's so fucking irrelevant, the price is never going to go get crazy too high. And, you know, it gets to be a little complicated to exp- to explain how a short works and how buying options on a stock rather than buying it outright works. It's just another financial instrument that options, buying an option on a stock is like locking in a price at a future date. It's something that yeah. used to only be available to the people that work at the big hedge funds and the big banks, right? Now with spots like, um, and by the way, they would do that at a price. Now on Robinhood, you can do this literally from your couch. And so a bunch of people on Reddit said, we're about to screw these people who shorted this stock. And another aspect of it, Nando, that I think is important and shouts to that Verge article that I read that I think is important is the um, awareness that the everyday Joes have of the contempt that professional Wall Street types and hedgies have for everyday Joes who do this day trading type of stuff. They know that yeah. they are looked at as pissant, idiot, amateur hour, <laughs> yeah. losers in their parents' basement yeah. by... You know, basically these Leo's character in Wolf of Wall Street types, right? And even he was a yeah. pissant to the people at the white shoe no, firms. Yeah, it's more like, uh, yeah. Like it's Lord like, Bank uh, find, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the real players yeah. hate people like Jamie you. Diamond. Right, yeah. Jamie Diamond, exactly. Hate these normal people. And 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 this is so unique to nowadays, Nando, is internet culture being like a, a sort of meeting ground. For people who yeah. know that, like, are acutely aware that they are the little guy, that they are put yeah. upon, that they are not yeah. the cool motherfucker in the Porsche, and they all get to congregate. And sometimes when they congregate, they do shit like this <laughs> and yeah. drive up the price of a stock and cost this one freaking company, what's it called? Melvin Capital. Five yeah, Melvin billion Capital. dollars since the year started. <laughs> That's billion with a B in three and a half weeks. Yeah. Just on fucking GameStop, y'all. Yeah. And of course, it's crazy. What, yeah, go ahead, Nando. Yeah. No, no, it's just it, it's it's um yeah, I mean it's 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 the the what I what I find kind of hilarious about this story is that um it's like a bunch of internet people got together and like, hey, how about we like take down a few hedge funds just for the lulls? Yes, you know, like, <laughs> we're gonna, we're, like let's let's take down a hedge fund, but like do it ironically and like post memes about it and stuff. <laughs> and, you know, like, <laughs> and it's like I was talking to my friend yesterday about this, and you know, he's a Veep writer, and he was like, uh, you know, what in many ways this is what like all Occupy Wall Street should have been doing from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Like instead of like occupying Zuccotti Park and like you know banging drums and doing uh, you know drum circles and shit, they should have been like going online on Reddit and just like uh, buying up stocks from random corporations that they liked who were like decrepit just to like destroy hedge funds who had shorted the shorted the stock. It's just it's just hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that this is something that can happen in 2021. It's really much, it's really like the most we're already we're we're only in the first month of 2021 and this is already like one of the most 2021 stories that you can imagine. Just like a bunch of like guys on Reddit destroying hedge funds but doing it for the memes. Yeah, and you know, what I also loved about this story Nando is that Robinhood is owned by a hedge fund. <laughs> yeah. Like essentially like is a huge hedge fund who owns this company whose job it is it's called Citadel Securities. And and what they do with the Robinhood bet is like we just want to see what normies are up to. Like that's valuable yeah. information for us and Robinhood sells your information to this giant freaking hedge fund which by the way And this is how you know the game is so rigged, Nando. Melvin Capital, which lost $5 billion on GameStop alone, which is just absurd. Crazy. It's absurd. Like, we just explained to you that- And other hedge funds may fall, too. Like, GameStop is nothing. 
It's it's literally like this company. If it it ceased to exist, it's tomorrow, dying. It's like it's a dying person. Like nobody yeah. would notice that this company even exists anymore. And GameStop, excuse me, and Melvin Capital could lose five billion on a bet they made on this nothing company. And yeah. our overlords. Yeah, GameStop wanna... lost eight hundred million dollars last year <laughs> in <laughs> like, revenue. Dude. Like last year, they spent lost eight hundred million dollars. And our overlords are constantly explaining to us that health in the market means health for us. These mm. motherfuckers are making bets of which they have to pay out five billion when they guess wrong because they got trolled in a three and a half week period. That's yeah. insane, dude. And the thing is that what the Reddit guys did with GameStop is not too dissimilar with to what hedge fund guys do. It's just, of course. you know, it just they just do it in a different way. Like hedge fund guys, like what they do is they, they place a bet, you know? And then what they do is they go on CNBC and Bloomberg mm -hmm. and they talk to all their friends and the media and the Financial mm -hmm. Times. And they're like, oh, this stock, you know, like they talk about they talk about the bet they that they place, which it. becomes yeah, a, yeah it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, in, in, in many ways, like, it's not like, you know, they, they have, they, they're both betting money on, on the stock market, but they also have influence by, you know, soft influence on how the stock performs by like things like, yeah, their reputation and going on these financial channels and the thing and talking about it. So this is just a version of what they do every day. The thing is like this time, the, the target was on them <laughs> and it was done by regular people, um, which is just, it, the whole thing is just very, very funny. Um, and also just like GameStop is such a funny company for it to happen to. It looks like AMC is next. Like they're going after AMC uh, because another company that's like really dying, these big theater chains, obviously they took a big hit during the pandemic. They had already been struggling for a while because of at-home streaming. Um, the, uh, Blackberry, <laughs> which was just destroyed by Apple um, and it's still kind of around, uh, but they're trying to revive that company. It's just, it's just, it's just really funny, the whole thing. It's a joke. And just remember again, just remember again, our government gave these people six trillion dollars at this point, just so that they could continue doing this. This to the benefit of nobody. <laughs> like to the benefit of nobody. And nobody in the government can do anything for normal people who have real fucking problems just never forget it man like i i just and again um nobody's going to go on tv on the sunday shows and explain why this is completely horse shit you're not gonna hear it on joy and reed's show you're not gonna hear it anywhere and and you're not gonna hear it on mad out either um and and again i don't mean to use those women as whipping boys it's just they're a certain type of media outlet. They serve a certain type of audience. They serve, quite frankly, the, the interests of a certain type of person, first and foremost, right? Um, and so, you know, next time you hear about the stock market and what it's doing and how it's soaring and how the quote unquote economy is just amazing because what's happening on that damn stock market um, just know to roll your eyes and be very suspicious of the person who's telling you that this shit actually matters, should matter to you. Yeah. Um, anyway, check that out. The Verge wrote a ex really extensive piece on yeah. this. Um, very good. well sourced. Um, go check that out. It's written by a lady named Elizabeth um, Lopato. Um, Shout out to Elizabeth Lopato. She did a great job sort of synthesizing mm. the absurdity of all of this. Um, and yeah, that's our show for today, guys. Thank you again for listening. As always, make sure you're subscribed to the Count the Dings YouTube and watch the show on YouTube. Um, make sure you subscribe to, to the Black Opinions Matter feed. If you're not, man, subscribe. Listen to all the offerings, whether it be Sunday service, excuse me, Wednesday service, Crazy Sexy Cool, Growing Up the Same. Of course, Cinephobe on the Count the Dings feed, man. Nando just did the latest episode of Cinephobe with the Hell Fast yeah. and the, uh, excuse me, I was about to say Fast and the Furious with Gone in nah. 60 Seconds. The precursor. Nicholas, the precursor <laughs> yeah. to the Fast and the Furious. Make yeah. sure y'all check that out, man. Right now, go check that out. Uh, of course, man, thank you to my man Rob Lopez on the ones and threes for always keeping the trains running on time. Fernando Vila, I'm Big Waz. We out of here. Peace. Later.